Hey friends, today's video is brought to you by the awesome folks over at Castify. Founded over a decade ago with the goal of turning Instagram photos into custom phone cases, Castify has become the world's most popular tech accessory brand. Because when cases are made better, they last longer. Their patented bounce cases include cutting edge Echo Shock impact absorption technology and can withstand being dropped from just over 21 feet. One case has tested 156 different occasions, which means it's six times stronger than other military grade phone cases. And with literally thousands of customization options, there's bound to be one that suits you perfectly. But for those who prefer something a little sleeker, there's always Casetify's signature clear case. The clear case is designed for long lasting clarity and is optimized to prevent yellowing to keep those bright whites looking pristine. But as stylish as it is, the clear case doesn't sacrifice security, as it too exceeds military durability standards with its 6.6 foot drop protection while maintaining a slim design, tactile buttons, and a comfy grip. Casetify also works with diverse global partners while supporting artist communities by partnering with some of the world's best new artists. Take this oddly familiar design by Oregon-based artist Tobias Fonseca, something I wouldn't mind seeing on my YouTube channel, let alone the back of my phone. So, if you'd like to upgrade your phone case, just head over to www.casetify.com slash let's read. And for all you loyal listeners, Casetify is offering a generous 15% off your order. That's www.casetify.com slash let's read and grab an amazing custom case for yourself or someone you love. I don't think dating is something I really want to focus on right now in my life. I never was big into the whole dating scene, mainly because I was always ultra-focused on progressing my own career. And even though you can absolutely focus on your career and date, my specific career path forced me to move and travel a lot. So as a result, dating was the last thing on my mind. I'm writing this account of events just days removed from the incident. Also, one last sidebar before I break it all down. To protect my privacy and quite frankly my job, I'm not going to give any specific names as it could have serious implications for myself or my career. Right from high school, I went to film school as my lifelong goal is to make movies. I love everything about film and I love all genres for the most part. What I really love is horror and I would love the chance to make horror movies one day. Anybody reading this who is familiar with the film industry will know it's not easy to make it in that industry without paying your dues. After graduating from film school, I secured some easy jobs on films. Nothing exciting or substantial, but my foot was in the door. My work mainly consisted of freelance work, any kind of job that I could get to pay the bills. I was living out west at the time, and California rent is not cheap, even with consistent work. After a few years of working on films in a very small capacity, I got a really good job that I'm still working on today. I'm not going to disclose the name of the show, but it is a fairly popular ghost hunting show. I really enjoyed working on the show. The people are great and I love all this stuff, even though I am aware that it's pretty much all fake. Oh yeah, sorry to burst your bubble if you're reading this and you believe what you see in those shows, but like all reality TV, all ghost hunting shows are completely fake. We find allegedly haunted locations from myths or local lore and set up some fun shenanigans and produce a fun and engaging story which gives the viewer just enough evidence that something sinister could be happening. I was what you probably could call a writer, I suppose. I would set up many of the locations and the scares and write the scripts for the talent. It wasn't the horror movies I wanted to create, but at least I was telling a scary story in some way. While working on this show... I was able to travel to a lot of fantastic places all over the world. Of all the wild and exotic places I got to visit for this show, it was in the New England area where I met Abby. She checked every box on my list of what I like in a woman, and most shockingly, she seemed into me. We hit it off immediately, and luckily we were going to be in the area for a few weeks filming a few different stories. Abby was infatuated with my work and loved horror as well. Specifically, she loved anything that pertained to the paranormal. Abby and I went out on a couple of dates and I was surprised how well they went. It all seemed too good to be true. It wasn't until we started talking in depth about my work that she started to unravel. 
and I mean she became truly unglued. This specific date was a little different than the others. Up to this point, we had been out to eat and gone out for drinks. But on this night, we decided to go on a scenic walk after dark. We were completely alone and sitting on a bench watching the water flow down the stream. In a sincere and soft voice, she asked, What was the scariest thing you'd ever filmed for the show? I just sort of chuckled and said in a playful tone, Well, when I'm filming, it's, it's all scary, really. She giggled but looked confused. I didn't think she was serious. I thought she was just kidding around. She then said in a more fishing tone, Well, have you always believed in this stuff, or did you just start when you started working there? I leaned back a little and responded in the politest way I could and said, Abby, I don't believe in ghosts or paranormal. This show and all the shows like it are fake. I create all the tension and the scares you see on TV. I mean, maybe there's a ghost out there, but <laughs> we sure as hell aren't recording them for television. Abby looked enraged, as if though I just told her that I stole her life savings. Abby, are you... Are you okay? I'm just saying I... She cut me off mid-sentence by screaming and holding up her hand to my face. I was in awe of this reaction. It's something I would see my three-year-old niece do and not a twenty-something-year-old woman. As I sat there in disbelief at the antics of Abby, she finally responded in words after her yelp and said, So, you lie to people. There are no ghosts... I shrugged off her attitude and said, well, Lie is a strong word. I prefer the word entertain. I allow people to use their imagination and wonderment. I kid you not, this woman started to weep uncontrollably. I have to admit, I was very confused, and I didn't know how to handle the situation at all. Before I could say anything else, she stood up and said, You know, there are spirits and evil in this world, and people like you are the ones that upset them. You're as good as dead. After this haunting little monologue she had, she turned and ran away. And I sat there alone on the bench and just shook my head in disbelief and kind of just laughed it off. A short time later, I headed back to my hotel for the evening. I called my buddy back in California and told him the whole story and he just laughed it off as well. He made an excellent point and said, you know, even if you don't believe in ghosts, you fake their existence for a living, it's not like you're an authority on the matter. They could still exist. You personally just happen to fake their existence is all. I thought that was so well put, and later that night at around 3am I was woken up by a bang on my door. It scared me. I looked out the people of the door and there was nothing or anybody there. I went over to the sink, washed my face, and sat in the chair in the room. After another minute or two, Bang. I jumped again to the loud noise at the door. When I approached the peephole, I again saw nothing. After a moment of contemplation, I decided that I was going to open the door and see if I could see anybody or anything in the hallway. When I opened the door, I was immediately struck, in the head, with a small bat or something. I fell to my knees and became groggy for a second, but I was able to get back up. Right on the side of the door, which would have been out of sight of the peephole, was a figure dressed in all black, holding this bat or object. They went to swing it again, but I was able to catch this blow from striking me in the head. Luckily for me, some of my production crew was staying right there on the floor with me, and they heard the struggle. Two of the producers of the show ran into the hallway and grabbed my assailant and pinned them down, while another producer called the authorities. Once they fell to the ground, I noticed the person was wearing some type of red devil mask. And the masked person wasn't very strong, as the two skinny producers were able to hold this person down, who wasn't saying anything. They were just struggling to get free every minute or so. Finally, the cops were able to show up and they removed the mask, Scooby-Doo style, really. And if you haven't figured it out yet, it was lovely Abby who had attacked me. Jesus Christ. She was arrested right away and honestly, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. Obviously, I should be pressing charges, but this woman is clearly, clearly insane. I guess she told the police that the demons told her to attack me because I mocked them or something insane like that. Just ridiculous stuff. And I'm sorry. 
I just don't believe that stuff. I'm only in the area for a few more weeks and honestly I may even head back to California now and just try and put this nightmare behind me. I've been in constant communication with my lawyer from the show and we're trying to figure out what exactly to do about the entire situation. I love horror and I've always wanted to make a horror movie but I never intended on starring in a real one. Back in 2013, an independent horror movie called VHS2 came out. The first one in the series was a monster hit, and personally I loved it, so it was inevitable that a sequel would be on the horizon. I don't think the movie got a wide release in theaters, or maybe it didn't get any release nationwide, but luckily for me, my hometown was getting a special screening of the film. When I found out, I was pumped. I asked my girlfriend at the time if we could go, and she agreed. I bought tickets ahead of time and couldn't wait until that night came to go see the movie. My girlfriend was happy to get a date night out of the event. I made my girlfriend arrive early for the 10pm movie because I wanted to get the seats that I liked. When we arrived, it was an empty theater, and as the minutes closed in, nobody showed up. I was honestly shocked. I knew it wasn't a super mainstream movie, but I thought that it would be popular enough to get an audience, and this was a special screening of the movie after all. About five minutes until showtime, somebody finally came into the theater. It wasn't a massive theater, but I would guess that there were probably about a hundred seats. My girlfriend and I were sitting dead center in the middle of the theater, so this person that came in by themselves sat right behind us. It was strange, since it was an empty theater and they could have just sat wherever they wanted, but this person chose to sit basically on top of us. I try not to let it bother me, since it was the best seat in the house. It's just some people have very little self-awareness. Maybe it's just me, but I wouldn't sit in the seat directly behind someone in an empty theater. I would at least sit in a row or two behind. After the first few minutes of the initial awkwardness, I just got over it and was ready to watch this movie. The movie started and I was hooked right away. This type of found footage horror movie, though done a million times, I still love it. Just a couple of minutes into the movie... The person behind us got up and just stood there. I didn't turn around, but I could feel them standing over me. My girlfriend was squeezing my hand because she was very uncomfortable. Finally, he moved and walked to the aisle. I looked over to see if I could get a glimpse of the guy. It was dark in the theater, but I could definitely make out a few features. It was an older man. I could see a white beard and he was wearing a black hooded sweatshirt. When I turned to look at him, he just stood at the end of the aisle that we were sitting in. Now I was pretty freaked out and more annoyed than scared because this was just starting to distract me from the actual movie. My girlfriend whispered to me to say something and I could tell that she was completely freaked out. I got the courage to just shout at the guy, Hey man, could you sit down or something? You're really distracting us from the movie. The guy held up his hand to wave to us and then turned around and walked out of the theater and I think I could hear him laughing. It was so creepy that we just sat on eggshells for a few minutes, but the guy never came back. Once the movie was around 20 minutes in, I forgot about the guy and just began to enjoy the rest of the movie. Now, the movie was around an hour and a half, and once the credits rolled and the lights came on in the theater, I started to talk about the movie right away with my girlfriend and share all the parts I loved. However, my girlfriend couldn't focus on the movie. She said that she was terrified that the man was going to come back. Every sound she heard in the theater made her jump. I felt horrible and a little selfish that I didn't even think about the guy. As we left the theater, we both decided to use the restroom before the car ride home. She was petrified to leave my side, but I was able to break away for a minute so I could, you know, do my business. When I got into the bathroom, all the urinals had signs on them that said, out of order. Weird, I thought, but it was no big deal. So I went into the stall and it's important to know that, that at this point, the entire building was basically empty besides a few employees and my wife and me. It was just about midnight and we were the last theater to empty out, so I didn't expect to hear anyone in the bathroom. Now while I was doing my business, I almost had an accident because someone slammed on the stall wall on the other side of the stall I was in. Hey buddy, I shouted. Hey take it easy next time, almost made me make a mess in here. And instead of a response, I just got a series of grunts. 
I just assumed it was some clown of an employee going to the bathroom. I flushed, and as I washed my hands, I noticed in the mirror reflection that that person's stall door was opening slowly. I stopped washing abruptly because I just had a bad feeling, and as I walked away from the sink, I swear that I could see that hooded man from the theater start to walk out of the stall. I couldn't be 100% sure, but I was almost certain it was the same guy. My girlfriend was already waiting for me, and I didn't want to freak her out anymore, so I didn't let on that anything was weird or wrong. I briskly walked over to her and promptly said to her, Hey, let's get out of here. I should have said something to one of the employees, but all I saw was two younger guys who really didn't look like they cared about their jobs too much, and honestly, I just wanted to get to my car and drive away. Besides, in that moment of thought, I didn't really think anything could be done, since this person really didn't do anything wrong besides kind of freak us out. It was just about midnight and we were walking to the car. It was an early summer night, but that night was on the chillier side. My windows were fogged up, so we sat for a minute in the car and I tried to lighten her mood with some jokes and silliness. This was also an attempt to lighten my spirits as well. When the fog windows defrosted, in the distance, probably ten yards or so, it was him. We saw the hooded man. Now it could have been anybody, but we knew it was the guy from the theater. My girlfriend immediately begins to freak out. She started to scream and panic and just kept shouting for me to drive, drive, drive. As I was putting the car into drive, the man sprinted at my car and dove on my hood as I started to pull through my parking spot. Her and I both screamed unconsciously and I made a sudden turn because the guy was hanging on my hood, like something you would actually see in a legitimate movie. And I'll never forget the eyes. We stared at each other for probably about two seconds, but those two seconds felt like hours in that moment. The man's eyes were wide and creepy. I know that's not a great description, but it's the only way that I can describe them. After that turn, he let go and fell to the ground. I sped out of the parking lot, and when I looked in my rearview mirror, I saw the man just standing there, waiting like I would turn around and come back to him or something. As we turned out of the parking lot onto the main road, we looked back one last time and the man was walking the lot in the opposite direction, towards the theater, and that was the moment that I finally felt some relief. Now, as a man in my 30s now, I would have absolutely called the authorities or even the movie complex to tell them to check the cameras, but for some reason, younger me just wanted to move on and forget about that event. I went back to that theater again only one other time nearly five years after that event, and like my girlfriend that night, every sound made me jump out of my skin. I was anxious the entire movie and I told myself I'd never go back to that theater. I have so many unanswered questions about that night, mainly who that guy was and what did he want from us? What would have happened if I didn't move quickly in the bathroom that night? What would have happened if we didn't drive away right when we did? I think I'm lucky to be sitting here writing this story and this is one date I'll always remember and not for the right reasons. With that look in that guy's eyes, I really do wonder if he was just on something and was losing his mind. The story I'm about to share isn't insanely scary, but more along the lines of toxic scary. I want to attempt to raise the awareness of creeps on dating sites like Tinder. I met a seemingly great guy whose name was Ryan, but I soon found out just how deceiving someone can be behind the curtain that is the internet. Shortly after ending a long-term relationship, I finally decided to get back out there into the dating world. I did what everyone else I knew was doing, and that was meeting people on Tinder. I didn't have a ton of success from the start because a lot of guys were looking for something that I just wasn't looking for. A few matches here or there, but they didn't amount to anything more than a few texts back and forth of just small talk. It wasn't until I met Ryan that things started to turn around for me. Ryan was sweet and charming, and he was kind of cute, which was just a bonus for me, really. I have several Disney tattoos, which I featured on my Tinder profile pictures, and he commented on them in a very nice and tasteful way. We bonded over a love of Disney, and he had a small Mickey Mouse logo tattooed on his inner bicep, and we messaged for a few days on Tinder, and then we exchanged Snapchat information instead of just our phone numbers. 
but for a couple of days, we snapped a ton. Harmless pictures of just us in our everyday life, and at night we would message for hours on the Snapchat app. Finally, after about a week we exchanged phone numbers. He started calling me beautiful and it started to feel like more than just a conversation with a guy. We finally set up an actual date and I was thrilled. We went to dinner downtown in the city where I live and then stepped out afterwards for drinks. I won't lie, this was probably the best date I'd ever been on. Ryan was charming and sweet. He held the door open for me, which I know seems small, but... You would be surprised how many guys don't do those little things that require almost no effort. That night we danced, and I never dance. Around 1am, he took me home, walked me to the door, and even kissed me goodnight. He could not have been more of a perfect gentleman. Now the next day we started messaging again. By this point I was head over heels for Ryan. I couldn't wait to see him again. We made plans for that evening to have dinner in a much less fancy setting. We went to one of the local sports bars, which is actually more of a family restaurant with a small bar inside. The night was just like the night before. I was having a great night and I couldn't believe I got this lucky with the first person I met on Tinder. After we ate, we sat there for a while and then decided to move over to the bar and continue hanging out for a while. Once we claimed our bar spot, I told him that I needed to use the restroom and that I would be right back. And that is when everything seemed to just start going wrong. I came back, and the charming man I had just become so accustomed to barely acknowledged my presence. Ordinarily, I wouldn't care, but I only point this out because it was just so out of character for this guy Ryan that I felt that I knew now. He sat stone-faced at the bar, drinking his beer and watching the TV. I started to talk and playfully flirt with him like we had been doing for a while now, and he just sort of ignored me. He barely even gave me eye contact. I couldn't imagine something that bad could have happened in the two minutes I was gone in the restroom. Only about five minutes after coming back from the bathroom, Brian stood up and told me that he had to take me home. He apologized but something from work came up and he needed to get home right away. He dropped me off and didn't walk me to the door or kiss me and this was not the same Ryan as the night before. That night I couldn't stop thinking about how horrible that date turned out. I finally broke down and just texted him and said, Hey Ryan, I noticed you didn't seem like yourself when I got back from the bathroom. I hope everything is okay. I'm thinking about you. And I added a couple of hearts and kiss face emojis and all that kind of stuff. It took about an hour but I finally got a response that said, It's fine. I'm fine. Good night. I will text you tomorrow. For a guy I just met... That text really hurt me. If I could show you all the texts prior to this one and how loving and affectionate he was, you'd also be concerned that something's wrong. I started to wonder if it was me. Did I say something that could have made him upset? He was fine literally two minutes before. The next day he asked me to go grab some coffee with him and he apologized for his strange behavior at the restaurant. He told me that he was going to explain everything at the coffee shop and not to worry. It made me feel a little bit better, but I still had that pit in my stomach. I figured maybe he ran into an ex or something like that when I was in the bathroom and that he wanted to tell me about her. Trust me, that would be something I would have zero interest in knowing. I met him at the coffee shop because he came right from work. He was already sitting there with two coffees when I walked up and he greeted me with a huge hug. He told me to sit down and just let him explain. He said in the most calm and collective voice, I just want you to know, I'm not a jealous person. I gave him a crook smile and said in a confused voice, Uh, okay, it's good to know, I, I'm not either. He didn't react to my statement at all. He continued to stare down at his coffee and he spoke up again. I saw you texting a guy named Sean. You're with me now. I just can't stand for that. And any guy here would agree with me. Not even processing the invasion of privacy that he knew who I was texting, I was more concerned with his phrase, you're with me now. Before I could formulate a response, he spoke up again, now much more aggressively. So you don't deny it then? You were texting a Sean. I, you know, I told you I'm not a jealous man, but th this is not okay. When you're someone's woman, you don't text other men, ever. Well, I'm no fool. 
As soon as this unbelievably twisted sentence came out of his mouth, I got up and started to leave. As I pushed my chair in, he stood up and now shouting at this point, Who's Sean? Hey, I'm not jealous, you can tell me. You owe me that. I owe him that. I started to walk away, embarrassed now because the entire coffee shop was now staring at us. He started to shout, I saw your phone when you went into the bathroom. You said I love you to Sean. You're just like every other girl, and I want everyone here to know. Finally, to the point of being enraged, I turned around and yelled, Sean's my sister. Sean is a female. You're insane. Ryan did not like this response. He started to follow me out of the restaurant, and he was continuing to scream. I I'm not a jealous man. I swear I'm not. You know, this is your fault. Thankfully, this outrageous coffee date allowed me to move right past the grieving process and right into being thankful that I never got more serious with this freak. He ended up spamming my phone with calls and texts for two days, and that's when I finally got a restraining order on him and blocked his number. At least once a week I get a call from some random number, but I have no way to prove it's him. Sometimes the calls are restricted, and the person on the other line is just breathing heavily. That was the worst date I'd ever been on, and the worst man I'd ever dated by a landslide. I'm not sure how I could have avoided this situation. Perhaps I could have moved a little slower and got to know him a little more before getting as cozy with him as I did. I know some people have had many more horrific stories on Tinder and other sites, and all things considered, I'm lucky. But the events of that day in the coffee shop still haunt me. The look in his eyes was horrible, and if I didn't walk away when I did, I don't know what would have happened. Ladies and gentlemen who use those sites... Please be careful and really get to know your date before you start getting serious, because a seemingly great individual could end up being an insanely jealous monster. I have always found dating hard. It's not from lack of trying, it's just something I wasn't very good at. There were several boys in high school that I liked, but they never liked me. I tried again in college, but same story. It really took a major hit on my self-esteem. I don't think I'm ugly, I'm just a little weird, and guys back then just didn't like that. I'm older now and married, but there was a time when I was desperate, and that desperation also became a matter of life and death. In my senior year of college, the whole virtual meeting thing was getting big on the internet. Websites like Omegle and Chat Roulette were huge. This was way before the Tinder craze or any of those other meetups or dating websites. One night, I finally decided that I was going to try one of those websites and see if I could connect with a boy. I don't even know if those websites exist anymore, and if they do, I hope they don't exist in the same way as before. Without going into explicit details, there were many unsavory things on those websites, and I'll leave it at that. If you're unfamiliar with those sites, basically the idea is great in theory. You get matched with a random video chat with a stranger to talk about anything you want. You can see how that may lead to things you don't care to see. Anyway, I sat on this Omega website for hours just being constantly skipped. I would meet someone, talk for a minute or two, and then I would get skipped. Finally, at some godforsaken time in the middle of the night, I matched up with a boy named Greg. He didn't skip me, and he found me fascinating. We shared just harmless stories about school and life and general interests, but nothing personal. Rule number one on the internet is never give away your personal information. I knew that, at least for a little while. We talked for nearly two hours in that Omegle chat window, and I was terrified of losing connections, so I finally asked for his number or his Facebook. He said he didn't have Facebook, and this was really before Snapchat or Instagram. They may have been around, but nobody I knew really had them yet. But he did give me his number and we decided to text instead. I was so excited and happy. I met someone who seemed genuinely interested in me and constantly complimented me, which I realized now was probably a red flag. But when you live your entire life never hearing those compliments, when they come, you kind of forget about the consequences. One of the biggest red flags that I failed to mention earlier was that he didn't want to show his face because he felt embarrassed but I was so scared of losing connection with him, I never pushed it. 
His chat window was a video of his chest down to his waist, so I could only see his arms and a Nike t-shirt. When we finally started to text, I asked if he could send me some pictures of his face now that we were texting, and he obliged me. He was gorgeous, and not at all what I was expecting. He said the picture was a little older, and that's why he appeared to be skinnier in the picture than he was on the camera. I didn't notice until he said it, but once he did mention it, I did notice a bit of a difference. In fact, the skin color even seemed different, but those old computer cameras were terrible, and he started flattering me again, so my brief moment of concern instantly puffed away. We texted all night and the entire next week. It affected my studies a little bit because I was more concerned with talking to Greg and not doing my homework. After a week of texting non-stop and with my constant begging, I was finally able to get Greg to go on a virtual date night with me, meaning we would video chat on Skype and watch a movie together or something. I just wanted to hear his voice again and not text. He begrudgingly agreed, claiming that he just had bad anxiety, but he would do it for me, his babe, which is what he started calling me. The entire next week leading up to our big date was blissful. He sent me dozens of pictures of that beautiful face and six-pack abs, which I didn't really care about to be honest. During this week, we also divulged a lot of personal information. I told him where I lived, like exactly where I lived. Obviously, in hindsight, I would never do that again, but we considered ourselves dating, so I didn't really think anything bad about giving him that information, especially because we constantly talked about meeting up one day. Finally, our date night came, and we were supposed to meet on Skype at 8pm, and I didn't hear from Greg until about 9.30, which was not like him, but I was just happy he made it. We never got to the movie part of the date because I spent the first hour of the conversation begging Greg to get on camera and microphone instead of just typing in the text box. He finally agreed, and it was the same angle as the night on Omega when we met, just his torso and his arms. As I really studied his background, he looked somewhere public, almost like a cafe or something, which was weird because it was kind of late at night. I called him out on it, and he said something along the lines of his internet got shut off, so he had to use the Wi-Fi at his local grocery store, which was a big supermarket that was open 24 hours and had a little cafe section inside of the market. It's easy to pick these details out in hindsight, but in the moment, I was blind. I didn't realize that the 24-hour market that he was in looked just like a 24-hour market in my hometown, which also contains a cafe inside. Instead of inquiring about that more... I started to really look at him and then at the pictures on my phone. Things were finally starting to seem a bit weird to me. The boy in the pictures had dirty blonde hair, was skinny, and had very tan, almost sun-soaked skin. The boy I was chatting with on Skype was a lot bigger. His arm hair looked dark and his skin was very pale, like porcelain doll white. I was not happy about our date night, and now I was uneasy about the entire Greg situation. It only took this long. I told him to show me his face or that I was hanging up for good, and he agreed. And as he started to lift the camera on his computer, the video feed faded. He started to type in the text box that something happened to his camera, and he apologized over and over. I was over it, though. We kept talking for a few minutes via the Skype text, but I eventually said that I needed to go. I laid there that night, honestly far more upset than I should have been. This was the first real intimate attention I had ever received, so it stung a little bit, as foolish as that may have seemed to some who read this. As a senior in my college, I lived off campus and alone in a small one-bedroom loft in the attic of a two-family house. At some point in the middle of the night, I was of course awake doing nothing, and I heard a funny noise coming from the bottom of the stairs. My loft had a staircase that went directly to the front door and bypassed the other two floors where other tenants lived. There was another front door right next to the front door that led to the other two apartments, so there would be no reason for anybody to be jostling my door. I made my way to the top of the landing and stared down to the door and watched as someone was actively trying to open the door. I stood there and held my breath in panic trying to process these events. It was a college town, so I thought it was possibly that maybe the tenants downstairs had too much to drink and were trying to unlock the wrong door. After a few seconds... The activity stopped. Right at that moment, my phone dinged, and it was Greg asking if I was awake and if I was home. I didn't answer right away because honestly Greg was the least of my worries. 
I continued to stare at the door which had been quiet now for a couple of minutes. My phone dinged again and, surprise, it was Greg. He said something weird which I now know was his attempt at fishing for information. He said, I just want to make sure you're safe. I heard in your town that there was a string of break-ins. If you have a spare key outside or something, I would definitely go grab it and bring it inside. You don't want an intruder to find it. Instead of responding to that text, I decided I was going to call him. And to my absolute horror, as soon as I pushed send, I heard a ringtone right outside my door. My call was ignored immediately by Greg and at the same time the ringtone outside my door stopped. I texted back, Greg, are you outside my house? No response. I called and the phone went right to voicemail. My heart was beating out of my chest. I slowly made my way down the stairs. There was a small landing with a closet for storage. On that landing was a small window that I could look out of and see the front door. It was Greg, and he was standing outside my door. I only know it was him because I stared at that stupid Nike shirt for a few hours during our date. And this was not the boy from the pictures. It was a middle-aged man, completely bald. As I stared out the window, I could see him trying to open the door every couple of seconds. I was sitting there holding my breath in tears. I wanted to call the police, but I left my phone upstairs and I was too scared to move. What happened next, I swear to you, is nothing shy of a miracle. Thank God I lived in a college town. The tenant who lived below me was just getting home with her boyfriend. She knew I would never have company like that at that hour of the night. As I stated before, we had two separate doors, but the doors were right next to each other, so she witnessed this guy trying to open my door. A brief verbal altercation transpired and Greg, or whatever his real name was, pushed her boyfriend and sprinted into the darkness of night. And that is when I finally ran down the stairs, opened the door and gave this girl who I've had maybe two conversations with a huge hug and thanked her. She invited me into her place and we called the authorities right away. I hate to type this next part but unfortunately they never found Greg. Who he was, where he was from, nothing about him. His phone, Skype, and everything had been faked, and nothing was real about this Greg. There was an investigation and so many red flags when I told the cops all the information. And this was before Catfish the show and before this type of thing even really happened to a lot of other people. I've always refrained from sharing this story for several reasons. First, it was traumatic and I hate to relive it. And secondly, it's hard to believe sometimes and I just hate to put myself out there to be called a liar. So many years have passed now and I have mostly moved on. My husband told me to write this story and maybe it'll reach one person, scare them into not giving away any personal information. I apologize for the long story but I'm happy I finally shared my horrifying experiences. If it wasn't for that Skype date and the off chance that my other tenant coming home when she did, I may not be sitting here writing this story. Be safe friends, the internet is a scary place. A few years ago, I went on probably the weirdest and most disturbing date of my entire life. At the time, I kind of just thought that she was crazy and I moved on with my life afterwards. It wasn't until I told this story over the last few months that I realized just how uneasy and potentially dangerous this story is. Whenever I tell friends or family about my date with Amanda, they scald me for not taking legal action or pursuing the law in any way. At the time, I was living in a city that was close to two hours away from my hometown, which is where I reside now. I was on the fence about moving home, but thought if I found a nice girl to date that maybe I would stick around in the city for a little while longer. On a cold Saturday night, I met a lively woman named Amanda outside of the casino in my hometown. At first, I'll admit she wasn't my type. She was loud and in your face, but for some reason I was into it on this night. I asked if I could buy her a drink and she accepted. She was a wild girl and honestly, I loved it at the moment. We spent the entire night at the casino partying and having a good time, and we ended up grabbing a room at the casino that night. The next day, we went our separate ways but exchanged numbers so we could set up another date. I decided to put my plans to move home on hold since last night went so well. 
We set up a date for a couple of days later. I was excited and ready to go on a real date with Amanda and get to know the real person behind the wild girl I met the other night. The date I got was something I'll never forget and made me wish that I had the girl from the casino back. We sat down and made a little bit of small talk before she started with her antics. We haven't even ordered our food yet and she said, do you want to see what our children will look like? I laughed nervously because I thought she was kidding. I asked in a nervous but stern voice, Did you say our children? What does that mean? Without hesitation, she pulled out her bag. The bag was one of those giant purses that I felt like you could fit a child in if you wanted to. And from the bag, she pulled out notebooks, pictures, and all sorts of other books and things. She started to present the pictures on the table like I was looking at colors to paint a room or something. She had all these digital photos printed on beautiful card stock of what a digital AI rendering of our children would look like. I was freaked out, but still half thought that this was some kind of sick joke, I guess. While showing me these photos, she then opened up all the notebooks containing all of her wedding ideas and planning and photos of the dresses she likes. She started saying things like, when we get married, and at our wedding, and that's when I cut her off. I felt horrible, but this got way out of hand fast. I thought I handled it nicely and gently, but she apparently thought otherwise. I said in a calm, rational voice, Amanda, I, I think you're great, but this is way too much for me. I, I don't even know you yet. I mean, you have to admit, it is, it is a little creepy, isn't it? Amanda froze in place and stared at me with rage bellowing out of her eyes. I could see her turning red and even starting to shake. She screamed a certain cuss word that I'm going to refrain from writing here and threw her water at me. She packed her bag and left. It was embarrassing, but I was happy that it ended quickly and I didn't have to drag it out any longer. That night when I got home, I told my parents that I would be moving home soon. My date with Amanda was the last straw and then I was going to be done with the city for this stage of my life. I dozed off early on the couch watching some football game and when I woke up, I had over 20 missed calls from Amanda. By the time I processed just how extreme that was, I had been alerted to a loud banging coming from my bedroom. I made my way slowly down the hall only to reveal Amanda was there in my bedroom. She was bending over in my closet as if though she was looking for something. I barged into the room and screamed, Hey! What do you think you're doing? She jumped because I startled her and she ran over and gave me a hug. And in a voice almost of desperation, she said, oh, Thank God you're okay. I was so worried about you. I threw my hands up and squirmed my way out of her hug. Instead of losing my mind or calling the police, which I should have done, I just screamed to get out of my apartment. I did say if she ever came back, I would call the police even though I never did. She put her hands up, started to cry, and ran out of the apartment. I was really freaked out that she had gotten into my apartment in the first place somehow. Feeling uneasy, I called my parents and told them that I was coming back that night. I was done with the city in that apartment. I figured that I would just go back and get my stuff another time. Once I got home after the long drive, I couldn't stop thinking about how Amanda got into the place and what she was doing in the closet. Those questions bothered me for weeks, and in the few weeks that I was home before going back to the city to get my things, I had received dozens of calls from Amanda that I ignored, and they eventually stopped. When we got back to my place to pack my stuff up and leave, the door was unlocked. It was shut tight but unlocked, and I always locked my door. Upon walking inside, nothing seemed to be stolen, at least nothing I noticed right away, the first place I went to look when I got inside was the closet. On the floor in the closet was a knife and some duct tape, two items that did not belong to me. I turned as white as a ghost, but of course I didn't report it. We packed my stuff and we left the city for the last time. I never heard from Amanda again, and I had no idea what she intended to do that evening. If I didn't scare her that night into dropping those items, who knows what could have happened. I've always told this story at parties when people start talking about bad dates or things like that, and for a while now, people have been telling me to write this, 
stating that I'm potentially lucky to be alive. To anybody reading this story about my horrible date with Amanda, I hope your date went better than mine. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. Last summer I broke up with my girlfriend for good. We had been on and off again for years, it just wasn't a compatible match. We had tried everything we could think of to make the relationship work, but when your heart just isn't in it, it's impossible to make it work. Instead of listening to my gut and just moving on, we agreed to go on one more date. A date to serve as a last-ditch effort to see if all the spark is truly gone. We agreed on a time and I picked her up. We had dinner at our favorite spot and everything was just fine. There never really was bad blood between us. Towards the end of our dinner, she suggested something that was extremely out of character for her. She suggested that we explore an abandoned church behind her new apartment. When we broke up last time, she moved out and moved into this small little spot in a small town roughly 15 minutes from where we used to live. Behind her small apartment was an extremely old church that was not in any kind of service anymore. She told me that she'd been looking at the building for a few days and nobody ever goes in or out and the building's empty. Her logic was that by doing something exciting and illegal, it would ignite some sort of spark in our relationship. I smiled and said, why not? It's the worst that could happen. When I was younger, I had done much worse stuff than this, so I wasn't nervous at all. We finished our dinner and drinks, and I drove her back to her apartment. We went upstairs and had another drink, and she claimed that she needed another drink to work up the courage to break into the church. I just kept laughing at her because I thought it was funny how nervous and jittery she was being. One drink turned into a couple of hours, a few glasses of wine, and some laughs. Finally, close to midnight, she finally asked the question in a shaky and nervous voice. Are you, are you ready to go to the church? I jumped to my feet from the couch and said in a commanding voice, Yes, ma'am. And she giggled, but I knew that she was not doing well. As she was putting on her shoes, I could see her hands shaking as she tried to tie the laces. And I said to her, We don't have to, to do this, you know. I mean, I'm totally okay just hanging out here. After the short struggle of tying her shoes, she perked up and said, No, no way. We're doing this. And then barged out of the apartment. We slowly walked and made our way to the rundown church, which was way bigger than I thought it would be. I was picturing some small, like, colonial church or something, but this was one of those big, fancy-looking churches. The door opened with minimal effort. Obviously, it was completely pitch black inside, so we used our phone flashlights to look around. Objectively speaking, it was admittedly spooky in there. Churches in general can just be creepy by themselves, but anywhere abandoned after dark is just objectively even more so. To lighten the tension a little bit, I kept jumping and making boo noises to scare her. I laughed, and she would scream, but it was all playful. She was holding to my arm, and it was honestly kind of nice. I couldn't believe it. But I was starting to feel a little bit of an ignite there, you know what I mean? And she may have been right about this. We explored some of the back rooms, and the building was mostly just trashed and abandoned. Nothing of value or anything of that sort was left inside. The main room of the church was filled with church pews, and there was a small altar with a small broken table. There was a big wooden cross on the wall, but it looked like cheap plywood and nothing that would be worth any money. In some of the back rooms, there were some robes, old books, a bunch of papers, and that's pretty much it. Even the candles were gone. I'm sure this church was still owned by the Catholic religion. It was just very abandoned and not operational at all. When we arrived back in the main room after a little adventure, I mentally prepared to make my move on her. I was going to kiss her and see if she would reciprocate the gesture. I grabbed her hand, and right before the kiss, we heard a loud smash. We rapidly shot our phone lights in the direction. We saw nothing. Whatever that noise was, it scared us half to death. I looked at her and whispered, Uh, maybe we should head back to your place. She didn't answer me though. Instead, she was frozen in fear. What is it? I said, still whispering. She didn't point, but with her eyes, 
that I could barely see in the low cell phone light. She gestured to the far side of the room and whispered, There's something over there. I promise you, I wish it was an evil spirit in the corner, because what was in that corner was infinitely scarier. A man, a real man, made his way out of the shadows and said in a stern voice, Get down right now and empty your pockets. She wasted no time, but I stupidly moved slow as I was trying to size this guy up to see if I had an advantage. While I was slowly moving to the ground, two more guys came from behind me and forced me to the ground very hard. She started crying, and I was pretty close to tears myself. Again, the man said, I'm not going to ask you again. Empty your pockets now. Neither of us had a wallet or money on us. I said to the guy in a frantic voice, Hey man, I, I don't have a wallet and she doesn't have her purse, man. I was at a loss for words. I tried to think of a way to defuse the situation, but my mind was just completely blank. All three of these men had some sort of weapon, but it was too dark to make any of them out. I'm not a religious man, but laying in this church, I was praying to get out of this alive. The men huddled around me and had some conversation that I couldn't hear. They were wearing face masks, so I couldn't make out the details, and one guy had a massive beard that stuck out from his mask, and another guy had a tattoo of a flower on his hand. Those were the only two features I could make out. While the men were deliberating about whatever they were talking about, my ex-girlfriend did something that still has me shook to this day. She got up and ran. The men were shocked by this action and had a delayed reaction to it, and two of the men chased her, leaving me alone with just one guy. I could see that his attention was focused on them running, so I jumped up and tackled the guy to the ground. I got up as fast as I could and sprinted as well. When I ran through the front doors, I saw that she was way, way in the distance and nearly out of sight, and the two robbers were walking toward the front door as if though they'd just given up, breathing. When they saw me running, they tried to jump back into fight mode, but luckily, I was too fast and I still had energy, so I was able to sprint by them. My adrenaline was pumping like insane. I caught up to her in just a few minutes, and we caught our breath together at a gas station down the road. We called the police right away. Well, we had the gas station employee call the police since we had dropped our phones in the church and made a statement and told them everything. They were surprisingly cool about the whole breaking in thing and didn't write that detail down in the report. When they went back to the church, obviously those robbers were gone and they didn't take our phones for some reason. They were still sitting on the floor of the church with the flashlights on when the cops arrived. Maybe they thought that they could be tracked if they stole it, but I'm not entirely sure. The most haunting detail about this entire story is what the cops told us a few days after our initial report. The lot that separated her apartment and the church had several cameras. In the video footage from that night, as soon as we walked out the back door from her apartment building, the men came from three different directions and began following us. Maybe it was the drinks that we had that night that made us oblivious, but... We had no idea people were behind us. When we made our way into the church, they entered almost right away behind us. The fact that they waited that long to make their move on us still gives me chills. And the fact that they were hiding basically in plain sight, I'll never forget. They never did catch those creeps, at least at the time of me writing this, and ever since that night, I'm always looking intently at hand tattoos to see if I can recognize the flower tattoo. And this goes to show you, you never know who could be hiding right in front of you. I love my wife very much. We've been happily married for almost 10 years now and we also have two beautiful children. We were high school sweethearts and attended college together. We planned on going our separate ways after high school but... We just kept finding our way back to each other. We even tried to see other people in college, but life just kept putting us together and I couldn't be happier. But enough of the sappy stuff, because unfortunately the story I'm going to tell you today is the opposite of sappy, and honestly the scariest thing that's ever happened to me or my family. One of the things that has kept my wife and I going strong all these years is just an overall very healthy relationship. Once a week we have a date night where 
We have done everything from dinner and a movie to midnight sledding and everything in between. It was one of these date nights that we encountered Caitlin. Now let me first say, I respect all people's beliefs, whether it's religion, science, paranormal, or whatever it may be, but that doesn't mean that I believe it as well. You see, my wife and I are very skeptical people. It's one of the things that's brought us close together all these years ago in school, and because of this, we usually keep these opinions to ourselves so we don't offend anyone. On this date night, however, perhaps we had a tad too much to drink. But our true feelings on certain subject matter happened to slip out, and it very much offended our server for the evening, Caitlin. The night started great. We had an amazing meal, great drinks, and great service. She was good at her job. When she brought me back my card after paying the bill, she sat at the table, which was kind of strange, but I've seen that happen a bunch of times before, and looked at my wife and I and said, What are your signs, guys? You guys look so compatible. Again, no disrespect, but astrological signs and all that stuff mean literally nothing to me. In a situation like this, I would usually just smile and kind of go along with the person, but for some reason, instead of acting like a decent human being, I just chuckled and said, That's <laughs> eh, all crap. Our signs don't mean anything. My wife looked shocked that I said that out loud and just grabbed my hands as if to tell me to watch what I'm saying. Caitlin looked not only surprised but angry. She turned her head and looked at me and said, Oh, really? It's crap? Well, I think I know what sign you are then. I continued to laugh for some reason. As I write this, I'm cringing at how I handled it. I was a jerk to this poor girl just because I didn't believe in a religion or whatever they want to call it. I stood up and grabbed my coat and in a very dismissive voice I said, You don't know my sign because you don't know my birthday. And even if you did, my birthday doesn't make me a good or bad person. So thank you for everything tonight, and good night. When we started to push our chairs in and walk out, Caitlin slammed the table, so hard that she knocked over the water glass on the table and said, You know, I hate people like you. You're toxic to society. I just looked at her, smiled like the antagonizing jerk I was being, and said, Well, this toxic person just left you a massive tip, so why don't you have some respect and have a good night? I didn't like at all how that night ended. I hated being confronted with something I didn't believe, and I hated even more how I handled the situation and how I acted. Not one of our better date nights. That night, my wife and I stayed at a hotel that was connected to the restaurant. We weren't far from home, maybe 20 minutes or so, but we tried once a month on date night to stay somewhere without the kids, the benefits of having retired parents. We joked about Caitlin that evening and had a pretty good laugh about it. When we woke up in the morning, I had several missed calls from my mom and a text message that said, Don't worry, everyone is fine, but call me right away. Definitely not a great text to wake up to. When I called my mom back, she said that she was with the kids and she couldn't talk, but she would send me a picture and then talk to me when I got home later that morning. The picture message was a broken window in my son's room. It was a brick with a piece of paper taped to the brick, and all the paper said was, what sign are you? I was enraged and told my parents to call the authorities right away. I went right into the restaurant and demanded to speak to Caitlin's manager who was incredibly dismissive of the entire situation. Caitlin wasn't there and the manager was some young guy who could care less about this potentially dangerous person who threw a brick through my window. And not only just my window, but one of my kids' windows. The manager just kept shrugging it off and saying, I don't know what you want me to do, dude. Caitlin's not here today, and even if she was, you have no proof that she did it, so just call the police and kindly leave my restaurant. My poor wife, she was already a nervous wreck, and she had to listen to me scream and cuss the entire 20-minute drive home. The cops were there when we arrived, already talking to my parents, and I explained to them the story of the night before, and they almost didn't believe it. But they did and said that they would investigate. I was not thrilled with that response, as... Now I believe my family was actually in danger. The cops unfortunately said the same thing that the manager said about not having any real evidence and at this point it was just he said she said. I was livid and not okay with this. My wife and the kids went to my parents house and I stayed alone in our house which I realized was a terrible idea but I wanted the evidence that everybody kept talking about. I didn't sleep at all that night. I sat in my living room playing Call of Duty. 
and at around 2 a.m. is when I heard a truck shut off outside. I turned my TV off and crept to the door and put my ear to it. I could hear movement outside, and it wasn't just one person. With all the lights off in my house, I could see outside the window and I saw two shadowy figures creep by. One smaller one leading the way, and another taller skinny one in the back. I followed their silhouettes all the way around the house to the backyard. Once in the backyard, I heard footsteps on the back porch and then all the way to the door. It took me this entire time to use my head and actually call the police, but I finally did it, and was able to whisper the situation without giving away my presence to the potential intruders. As I waited anxiously for the next move, it finally happened. They started to turn the doorknob and then shake it once they realized it was locked. I was crippled in fear as to what I could do if they got in. I heard a lot of whispering, but I couldn't make out any words or if the whispers were actually male or female. Thankfully, the cops were close, and before I knew it, the lights from the cop car illuminated the entire front of the house, which flooded to the back. I heard a female voice scream something about being toxic, and then the footprints sprinted away. I ran out of the front door and told the police that the intruders fled out the back and were running that way, and apparently they had a car patrolling, but they weren't able to catch them. The cops investigated, but there was literally nothing they could do, as they said. At least, that's what I was told, and it felt like they were completely useless. I believe those two nights I was terrorized was by Caitlin and the manager from the restaurant. I, of course, can't prove it 100%, but all the clues added up. Thankfully, this is the last interaction I had with that psychopath or anybody else trying to break into my home. But unfortunately, nothing ever happened legally. I know the ending isn't satisfying, but sometimes life just isn't that way. I've since moved and I've never gone back to that restaurant, and trust me when I say that I never will. My wife and I still have date night, but nothing will ever be as nightmarish or toxic as that weekend. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And there are some super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. You should come check it out. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit at r slash letsreadofficial, and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data. And they're located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links are in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, skill issue.